Hello, my name is Joe Graber and today we're going to be talking about curvilinear motion using normal and tangential components. In this video I'm going to introduce the concept of normal and tangential coordinates and also a trick that we need to do our derivations. In the next video I'm going to derive the equations that we're going to be using to make a lot of problems in dynamics much easier to calculate. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is look at the difference between normal and tangential coordinates and rectangular coordinates. So I will kind of want to remind you about rectangular coordinates really quick. It's what we've been using throughout and the one I think most students are most familiar with. So let's just picture that you're, uh, you have a racetrack and you're going to be in a race car going around corners. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw a quick racetrack. Okay, we got some corners there. With a rectangular coordinate system, we need to choose an origin, right? So we can choose an origin pretty much wherever we want. And the big thing about the origin is it's fixed, okay? So let's just pick uh, somewhere in the center. Okay, this is going to be my origin. It's fixed, and then we define our directions with two unit vectors. Of course, the unit vectors go in the x and y direction. The first one we call unit vector i, and the second one in the y direction we call unit vector j. Those two unit vectors are then used to describe the position and velocity of the location of the particle. So what's the particle? Well, that's the race car going around the track. We have a race car. Let's say it's right up here. Use a different color. Let's say it's right up here. Okay, so we have a position vector that's going to go from here, and it's going to have a certain amount of i, maybe 3 this one looks like 4i, 3j to get there, something like that, right? That's going to be the position vector. And of course, we have a velocity vector, which is also going to be written in the i's and j's. Okay, so that's how rectangular works, and you've been working with that uh, throughout dynamics so far. Um, but I have a question to ask you. So let's say you're going around this racetrack, and let's say this curve right here has the same radius, so the same curvature, as let's say, what's one that looks like it? This curve down here. Okay? Those two have the same curvature. And you're going around those two curves at the same speed. Would you expect to feel the same force? And now let's talk about that force for a second. Uh, hopefully you've all felt it before. You're in a car. If uh, in that car the person hits the gas, you're going to be thrown backwards. It's going to push you against the seat. They hit the brakes, you're going to be thrown forwards. They go around a right-hand corner, you're going to be thrown towards the door. If you go around a left-hand corner, you're going to be thrown this way. Right? Well, well, what's doing the throwing? Is there someone in the car pushing you? Hopefully not. Um, <laughs> what's happening is actually just acceleration. Uh, when your body is a moving mass, and Newton's first law tells us mo objects in motion want to stay in motion. You have momentum because you're in the car. And when the car decides to go this way, your body wants to keep going straight. And that's how, why you're feeling that. It feels like a force pushing you. So if you're going around a corner up here, it has the same radius as one down here, and you're going the same speed, wouldn't you expect to feel the same uh, forces? Yeah, that's, you would. And intuitively, I think you know that. However, if we try to calculate that with i and j, it would be pretty complicated. This vector up here, and let's say we're on the same part of the curve, we have another velocity vector. right? We have a position and velocity vector for both of those. They're going to have different i's and j's. And yes, we could go through all the math and we would find out in the end that once we found the components in the x and y direction of acceleration and we took the magnitude of those two components, we would find out that you did have the same acceleration. But wow, what a lot of math. And also, what if you're trying to do the entire racetrack? Wouldn't you want something a little bit more intuitive where you could just calculate the forces or you'd calculate the acceleration you would expect to feel based off the radius of those curves and the speed you're going? Well, that's where normal and tangential comes in. We're basically transporting ourselves to a different frame of reference. So in this one, we have a fixed frame of reference you can often call earth fixed. The origin does not move. In normal tangential, it does move. We are transporting ourselves into the car. The origin is now on the particle. Okay? And with that, 
we have to make new i, j's, and k's. And we're not going to use i, j, and k just because that would be confusing. We wouldn't know which coordinate system we're going to use. So we're going to call those unit vectors something different. The first one, we're going to call tangential unit vector. It's always going to be tangent to the curve. It's going to be in the direction of motion. We're going to call that u, t, unit vector sub t. OK, the next one, we have to introduce a concept of the curvature. Now, I talked about that briefly. If you think of this racetrack, you could really define this racetrack as a collection of circle arcs. Okay? So down here, you might picture this as an arc of a circle. And that circle's right here. And that's the, that's the center of the circle. If I draw this, this would be the radius of the circle. We're going to call that rho. We're going to call that radius rho. Hopefully you can see that a little better. And you call that radius rho. And if you picture small segments of the racetrack, you could really define the entire racetrack by having different rows and different origins. Over here, you would have a bigger circle, because this is a less of a curve. The origin would be here, and you'd have a different row. Okay, So really, for any line or any shape, you could define it as a bunch of circle segments. Uh, what would row be for a straight line? Hopefully, you know intuitively that would be infinity, right? If the radius is infinity, we'd have a straight line. Okay, so these these rows we're going to call the instantaneous center of curvature, or the just the center of curvature. And that is how we're actually going to define the perpendicular component to u t. We're going to find wherever that circle arc is. We'll say this one going like that. We're going to find that center. So it would be somewhere in here. And uh, I want to look perpendicular. So it would be somewhere in here. This would be our center, and this would be our row. And our un is always going to be towards that instantaneous center of curvature. We're going to call that un. OK, so we've set up our coordinate system. We have a ut going in the direction of motion, and we have a un going perpendicular to it. Now, the thing to really realize here is that ut and the un, they don't stay put like i and j. i and j never change direction once we pick that origin. ut and un do change direction. If we look at when the race car is up here, let's do down here so you can see better. Race car is over here. OK, we now have a, no, a new ut going in the direction of motion. Now, I drew it longer there just so it's easier to see. The ut will always have a magnitude of 1. It's a unit vector, just like i and j. And then, of course, we have our un pointing towards that instantaneous center of curvature, which would be somewhere in here. And we'd have our rho, which would be defined as that distance. OK, so now we have that figured out. Now I need to introduce one more concept th so that we can start the derivation. And that concept is going to be one that you already know, and that is arc length. So arc length and radians is likely something you've used a lot and something you learned probably back in geometry. But I just want to refresh your memory really quick. The definition of a radian is actually the, um, it, it's a unit of angle, just like degrees. And the definition is the angle at the inside of a circle that would produce an arc that has the same length as the radius. Let me draw a quick picture of that. So if we have a particular section of this circle, think of it as a pizza slice, and we have some angle, we'll call that theta, and that's given in radians, and then we have the radius. Basically what that's telling us is the arc length, so the distance the distance from here to here, that arc length. We'll call it s is equal to r theta, where theta is in radians. So pretty simple concept, but we're going to use that in our derivation in order to take the, the rate of change of uh, ut. Okay, And there's one more very important thing. You might be wondering, well, how would I figure out my rho in some of these problems? Some of them it'll be given to you if you um, 
if you know the description of the curve based off that row, that's great. That's information given. Other times, you might be given the curve with a function, y equals f of x, right? y is a function of x. And there's an equation uh, that you can use to convert the function y equals f of x to a row at any given point. I have that written down here so it's easier to read than my handwriting. So you can see up here, you can calculate rho from any function. If you can take dy dx, which of course is the, the rate of change of y with respect to x, you can calculate dy dx. And if you can calculate the second derivative uh, of y with respect to x, if you can calculate those two things, you can get rho. Now, yeah, the equation's a little bit complicated. It's 1 plus the derivative of y with respect to x squared. All of that in brackets goes to the 3 halves. And that's on top of the second derivative of y with respect to x. And notice the um, absolute value sign. So even if that's a negative, you put it in as a positive. OK, so that's an equation that you can find in your textbook on page 59. And I'm not going to go through the derivation here, but that's something you can use to find rho from a function. OK, let's summarize what we've learned in this video. The origin. Uh, if we're doing nt coordinates, the origin is located on the particle, and the origin is moving. Our u, t, and our un are also moving. The t axis, the tangent axis, is always going to be in the direction of motion, and it's always going to be tangent to the path. The un axis is going to be perpendicular to the ut axis, and it's always going to be pointing to that instantaneous center of curvation. Okay, hopefully you learned something from this. Please go on to the next video where we will be deriving equations to help us solve these problems. Thank you.